James chapter 1. <clears throat> and we are, uh, let's see, the course we're dealing with is called Troubles and Trials, Stumbling Blocks or Stepping Stones. <clears throat> it seems that there are those who have conspired just to bring troubles and trials into our lives. <clears throat> And um, Debbie and Kelly, stop it. <laughs> All right, we've been uh, looking at various scriptures in advance of just reading the book um, to, to really consider <clears throat> these scriptures in light of what we, what we believed before we got to this class, I guess you could say. Um, and we stated last time that uh, pretty much everyone um, said that they believed the whole Bible. And we decided that um, we don't know the whole Bible. I was just, honestly, I was just back, and when I got here, I went back to my office and sat down and opened the Bible <clears throat> to Hebrews 12 to a portion of scriptures about six, seven, eight scriptures in a row, looked at it, read it real close, just, you know, meditating, Lord, you know, and I still don't get it. And I know there's something in my spirit that says there's something so big here, you know, and I don't get it. And I reminded the Lord that some years ago I had asked him, now I'd really like to see you here in these scriptures. And so I just reminded him again, you know, I mean, you know, I'm patient, you're patient, we're all patient. <laughs> I'm 64, <laughs> you're the ancient of days. <laughs> Could you speak a little quicker? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm 65. Wow. <clears throat> anyway. Who is that old man? <clears throat> James, chapter 1, and verse, let's start at verse 2, and we'll look at 2 through 5. <clears throat> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. <clears throat> okay. Just, just for a show of hands, how many of you have ever found, fallen into, you know, various trials? Raise your hand. Okay. And how many of you... Remember clearly that your basic response throughout was joy. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> all right. So what does that tell us? It tells us that we're out of whack with the Word of God. No, it tells us that, yes, that we are, but that there is, <clears throat> there is a human response or there is our response and there is the response that God is calling for based on things that are true that we don't yet see. For example, um, there's this thing called the hidden wisdom of God. Amen? You ever really looked at that, that in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1? <clears throat> and all, all the way up to 4, I guess. Um, hidden wisdom of God. Um, the cross was the hidden wisdom of God. It didn't say it was the hidden wisdom of that moment. <clears throat> that, that this cross way of thinking is the way God thinks when it comes to wisdom. And he, he solidifies that by saying, let this mind be in you. And, and it's that same hidden wisdom, isn't it? All right, <clears throat> so let's just say it like this. So if, I'm just going to say it like this. So if we encounter various trials and we respond as a human and not as a son of God, one who sees and is part of the family and is of the seed of, of God by Christ, <clears throat> new birth, then whatever hidden, whatever 
information that we have gleaned about hidden wisdom, it's not our wisdom yet. Because we're not, we, we don't think that way. We don't react that way. How about that? We don't, that's not natural to us. Um, and so uh, the scriptures talk about the hidden man of the heart. The scriptures talk about, <clears throat> for we are hid with Christ in God. In fact, it says this, for ye are dead, and your life is hid. Okay, so this hid life is based on us being dead. Okay, this, this hidden life. Now, this is the life that we have in God. Um, <clears throat> and the next verse talks about, this is Colossians 3, 1 through 4. The next verse talks about when he who is our life not our soon coming king, but when he who is our life shall appear. So it's not talking about, and you can check the context there. It doesn't just all of a sudden jump into eschatology or something like that. The context is how we live. <clears throat> and he who is our life, but the definition of that life is not he. I mean, it is, but it's not found in the words he who is our life so oh that's the hidden life it's found in having the reality of what is hid revealed to us does that make sense that it's not just accepting the scripture after it because then it wouldn't be hid would it he who is oh okay jesus is our life okay but you know and then as we usually do we grab half of it it says for you're dead he who is our life but it is hid, just like the hidden wisdom. <clears throat> and there is a succumbing to the clear fact that there's a lot of stuff we don't know yet. Okay. That, that's tough on prideful people. But on people that really or after the Lord, you'll find regularly that there's stuff that you really don't know. I mean, people ask me questions all the time, and I have to say, I don't know. And they always kind of go, you know, you don't know? Somebody said to me once, it's so-and-so, so and so I said, I don't know. And they said, I thought you were like the Lord. I thought you knew everything. <laughs> and I said, I do, but I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Just messing with people. All right, let's finish our verses. <clears throat> um, two, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing this. There's your key. That the testing of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. Okay, all right. Oh, my God. Do you see what that's saying? You even see what that's saying? That's saying that God is at work in these trials. First of all, God's at work in these trials, and he's working on us. <clears throat> and he's wanting us to be patient <clears throat> and let that patience hold us unto the perfect work. Okay? <clears throat> um Knowing this, that the testing of your faith worketh patience, but let, okay, so, so some people just stop there. That's it. Okay, God's testing your faith, so just be patient. And then all that God wants is just you to be patient. That's it. Okay. Um, well, that wouldn't hurt. <laughs> Couldn't hurt. <laughs> Oh, excuse me, pause for one second. Claudia, happy anniversary. Okay. <clears throat> I don't get to see her as much as, you know, so I have to get these things in when I can. <clears throat> um, yeah, patience is a great thing, and patience is a part of this thing, and you'll never, you'll never, I mean, you might as well settle this right now. You'll never get to the fullness of Christ without patience. 
because so many people are fast food minded and they want it right now and they pull up and they want it through a window and when God doesn't give it to them they move on and they you know and then a lot of times they'll accept anybody that can give it to them fast well you know the Lord is doing a work in us. We are his workmanship. You do realize that, don't you? You know, Jesus was a carpenter. He worked on wood. Now he's sitting at the right hand of God and he's working on us. Knock on wood. <clears throat> Actually, knock on our wooden heads because we don't get it a lot of times. See? Back to weeping again. When are we going to get it? But let, 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 the word let, <clears throat> it's a yielding word. It's not an active word where you go out and you make it happen. Let's go let. Yeah, let's go let. You know, let's let patience. How do we do that? By just calming down, sit down and shut up. Excuse my French. <clears throat> but be patient. Uh, but let patience have her perfect work that, see, this patience is having a perfect work that something might happen. Not patience is what is happening, that something might happen. <clears throat> that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. All right. <clears throat> All right. Um, so if somebody ever implies to you, you need to be perfect, your response will be, nobody's perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. Amen. And you're going to be perfect in him. You're not going to be perfect in yourself. The Bible says you're complete in him. It doesn't say you're complete in yourself. That you may be perfect and entire lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, wisdom, what, okay. <clears throat> All right, let's see. Good for you. If it, you know, here's the general, we read this and here's the general thing. We read the Bible in chunks. I think we do that because there's chapters and there's verses and then there's clumps that make sense and there's clumps that don't. Anybody agree with that? I, I think that's, generally true. Now, um, sometimes it's good to read different translations so it helps break up your clump mentality. It does. It helps me anyway. And I, it helps me to, you know, I, I've read things that didn't have, I mean, this particular Bible, the one that I use regularly also has little subtitles that man put in there. And so many of my translations don't have that so that I can just go and go, oh, that's what he's talking about. <clears throat> this one here is real common. We go, if any man lack wisdom. So somebody comes to you and they say, you know, I just don't know. Should I sell my house or should I, you know, da da da? And, the, and the, a good Christian will say, oh, well, if anybody lacks wisdom, just ask a God. Okay. This is in relationship to this thing of counting it all joy and letting patience have its work. And you see what I mean? That's the context. It didn't just all of a sudden go, you know, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and know that the, the testing of your faith is work in patience and let patience have its perfect work so that it brings you to a place of not lacking anything in the Lord. Um, Oh, by the way, and you know, if you need patience for that house situation, or because that's where you, we usually use it, you know what I mean? Uh, if you, you know, if you don't really know the answer on that thing, we don't know the answer on this thing about counting it all joy when there is. You understand? I mean, if we just, you know, we go, well, I don't know about that. Well, we don't know about the Word of God. We don't know about this. We need the Holy Spirit to teach us what he's saying, not pull scriptures out and throw it at, at whatever we don't like or what we're struggling with, you know. Well, here's a scripture. Bam, you know. <clears throat> and so we ask God for wisdom, and he, go, he never answers. We go, you know, well, pastor, you said, 
And if anyone lack wisdom, let him ask to God who give it liberally and upbraid it not. And I asked to God, what should I do with that house situation? And he, <laughs> I just, I'm sorry, I just had a picture of us coming into the throne room going, you know, Lord, you said, you know, if any of us lack wisdom, let him ask to God, you know. <laughs> And, and the Lord goes, get out of here with that. Look, we're trying to get settled in Christ and in, his, in the reality that is eternal. So, you know, get out of here. And you go, he says he, he upbraided not, and he just did it to me. No. <laughs> well, I don't know that the Lord would actually respond that way, but I do know that that's what this is about. This is about finding that God is at work in these situations and he can bring you through that to a place of the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. He makes me, I don't do it. He leads me, I don't do it. I'm perfect and entire lacking nothing when I'm in union with him. Anyway, I was thinking about this, um, just this thought, that many, uh, many people, and I wrote down a bunch of scriptures, I'm sorry I don't have it with me, um, but many people attribute to grace what really should be attributed to the nature of Christ. Because, and I, I looked up a bunch of scriptures, I just put a bunch of them down, that showed that certain things that, that the average Christian that I know of, the average Christian I know of, uh, <clears throat> they go, oh, well, you know, I just, need, I just need the grace of God. No, you need the life of Christ. I, and, I, you know, that's a little challenge. I challenge you to just think about that, maybe try to check it out in the scriptures a little bit. It's sort of shocking to realize how many places. Okay, but you go, well, well, then what about the grace of God? Well, the grace of God is that, you know, by the grace of God, he tasted death for every man, meaning he brought us all into death, so that by his nature that came through the grace of death and the grace of giving us his life can produce what pleases the Father. Anyway, <clears throat> and I'm sure it's not confined to that. You know, the grace of God is abundant, okay? It's abundant. Um, uh, see, I don't want to get off on this. Holy Spirit, you're starting to throw scriptures at me. <laughs> but, you know, there's something to that because, and I'm, I'm going to try to end with this, but it, there's something to this thing of grace and his nature in that we keep attributing honor and glory to inanimate realities, grace, just a, a, a magical Grace did this, you know. Well, what about Jesus? Well, no, no, I don't want to talk about Jesus. Well, how about Mary, the mother of Jesus? No, I want to talk about grace. Sorry, I, it's another woman, but my granddaughter. But, but the, uh, that's the idea. I mean, it's like we, go, we look at the Catholics and we go, oh my God, they're attributing to Mary the things that Jesus ought to get. Well, what are we doing? We're attributing to some, I'm looking for the right thing, some, some grace yeah, <laughs> ethereal grace cloud. Yeah, very well said. That we go, oh, thank you, grace. Who's, where does the glory for that go? Poof, right there in that, that vanishing cloud. And yet we say, all glory to Jesus. All right. Now, you're... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You say, Randy, why? Why do you always have to make such a big deal over this stuff? You just drone on and on and on. And it's, you know, it's really not that big a deal. Okay, well, maybe it's not to most people. I'm just going to tell you, it's a big deal to me. It's a big deal to me because I believe Jesus ought to get the glory. 
And I love Jesus. I don't love grace. I love Jesus and the grace that has come through him, you know, <clears throat> and or any other subject. And, uh, you know, I mean, you think of, you think of Nadab and Abihu, and they're in there, doing, they're not in there sinning or shooting up drugs or, you know what I mean, or, or stealing money or something like that. They're trying to do the things of God, but there, something's missing, you know. And, and my point of even using that is, if Jesus is missing, I don't want it. I don't want to play that game. I don't want to play that religion that leaves Jesus out. I want Jesus. I, you know, I mean, do we think we're going to, you know, are going, again, I always painting this picture of the throne room. Do we think we're going to walk into a throne room? There's going to be two throne rooms, Jesus, and then this furry pink cloud called Grace. <laughs> well, which one am I going to go to? Let's see. Grace has had a lot more effect in my life than Jesus. I got Jesus saved me, I know. But Grace was the one who made everything happen for me. I mean, it's, it, the, the picture is ridiculous, and so are we. <laughs> if we can't see clearly that we're giving honor to something that, that gets no honor, and it's like speaking something that disappears, whereas to give Jesus honor and glory, and, and how are we going to do that? How are we going to give Jesus honor and glory? Because our hearts are fixed on him, and we're not easily led astray by good things or bad things. You know, we're going, oh, I, I'm watching it, man. I ain't going to let nothing lead me astray or I'll do something bad. But, you know, watching it ain't enough. Watching him is the answer. <clears throat> All right, you know, again. Why do we? Why can't we just stick with the subject? Why? Why does it always have to be Jesus? If you hadn't figured that one out yet, then I'm in the wrong place. All right. So there is this this strange place that God wants us to be that is in our being fixed in such a manner right now it's hidden it's mystery it, we don't understand but fixed in such a manner that when various trials not just clear cut oh this is persecution or you, you understand what I mean Ver when various trials come that somehow, instead of freaking out, excuse my hippie, <laughs> <laughs> instead of freaking out and, you know, hey, what's going on? I don't know why. God, why are you doing this? And, and, uh, and in some cases, blaming God. In other cases, blaming wh whoever initiated the problem. Uh, amen. <laughs> <clears throat> we say, well, who do I blame? This isn't talking about blame. It's talking about handling things. By the way, this is the first chapter of this book, chapter one, internal and external trials. That's what it's all about. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I wish that the scriptures meant so much to us and we, knew, we didn't know the Lord like we needed to and there were areas such as this and many other areas that we clearly didn't have working in us by life that the scriptures, instead of condemning us, would stick with us enough that when we get into various trials, we at least, if we freak out, say, Lord, clearly this isn't working in me. 
I need you to open my eyes to your meaning of the word. You know, we're going, oh, I want to see something deep. Well, this is pretty deep. <laughs> you know, it's pretty deep. But we go, oh, I don't want to see that. And, and I understand, you know, because I understand that there are some people that get exquisite joy out of being mad at somebody else. But there are people, they go, I love hating you, you know. <laughs> and uh, you try to take that away. I mean, honestly, you, you try to take that out of their hands, and they will fight you. No, no, I don't want to give up that. It's, uh, it's my precious, you know. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> you know, the f phrase they use is like taking candy from a baby. If you've ever tried that, good luck. <clears throat> it's easy as taking candy from a baby. <clears throat> uh, ah. So let's go to another scripture that goes along with this. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Oh, my God. People. We don't, do we? They, maybe they did. Wow, maybe the first church was really like the, like the first actual church. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing that that was the case, you know, that they actually lived and breathed and believed the word until, notice not the way I'm saying it, believed it until... It was life in them, and they had gained this wisdom and asked of, Lord, give me this wisdom of these realities so that it will be life in me. Because wisdom, you know, wisdom, you know, knowledge is gaining some information. Understanding is being able to chart it and whatever. Wisdom is when you start to live by it. Okay. <clears throat> So that's why the Lord said, let him ask for wisdom. Because he's given him the information there in James. And he wants them to go beyond just having information about it. We, you know, again, we can know all day long that, uh, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation. We, and, but be the opposite of it in our responses. All right. <clears throat> so... What is the point of that? The point is not condemnation. The point is hunger. Find Jesus in this reality. If you find Jesus in this reality, it will bless you. It will take you above things instead of fighting in the world, living in the muck and the mire of this world and the war of this world and living by Christ and being able to, even though this world, you know, in it but not of it, even though this world will tie you up or hang you on a cross or, or mistreat you. Uh, I'm just, I'm picturing people like, you know, Joan of Arc, I'm picturing people, Christians that were in the Colosseum fed to the lions. I'm picturing them, you know, being burned at the stake and yet you see the glory of God. There are, there are realities like that. You do know that, don't you? <clears throat> and they're just like, you know, like Jesus on the cross, blessing the people instead of cursing them. And every one of us look at that and go, oh, my God. Oh, my God, that's so spiritual. You know, that's your God. Um, but when somebody tries to apply it to us, we go, I don't want to be burned at the stake. No, no, no. Well, but you know why you don't want to be burned at the stake? Because you don't understand this reality, and you can't count it all joy. You can't glory in tribulation. You can't. All right. <clears throat> well, what is the goal of it then? Oh, the goal of it is so if we ever get, you know, burned at the stake... We'll do, we'll do well. No, the goal 
is that we know these realities that come not just from the scripture, but from the heart of God. Because, you know, we know the scripture, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You ever heard that before? Well, this is the abundance of God's heart speaking to us. All right. So, <clears throat> we live every day as Christians. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to read my Bible every once in a while. And I'll pray when I really need something. And, and, um, and how long are you going to do that? Um, I'm going to do it today, tomorrow, and all next week and next month. And I am going to put this on cruise control and never get my heart down to where I just want the Lord and nothing but the Lord. Do you know how long you can go like that? A <coughs> lifetime. A lifetime. You'll wake up at the end of your life and go, what did I do for the Lord? What did I do in seeking the Lord, to find the Lord? <coughs> and, you know, I was telling somebody recently this. I said, you know, I've realized that so many of the things, so many of the projects I wanted to do, so many of the books I wanted to read, so many of the books I wanted to write, I mean, not when I say so many, just a few. Just, I mean, I've got two on my heart I've wanted to write for years. And I've almost come to the conclusion that they'll never get done. I'm, I'm getting that close. That they'll never get done. And I tell you what, that breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because I know the Lord has spoken to me in relationship to two books that are meant for his people. But, you know, well, what about it? Well, I never got around to it. And I probably heard somebody share something like that when I was young <laughs> and probably thought, well, that won't happen to me, you know. So instead of looking at the harvest that I've sowed in the past, I focus on sowing whatever seeds I can every day <coughs> of the Lord. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Tribulation works patience. I remember reading that one day and I went, well, it's sure working my patience. <laughs> tribulation is working my patience right now to the bone. <laughs> and uh, patience... Uh, where am I? Work of patience and patience, experience, and experience, hope. All right. So this patience is bringing us through trials. It's not delivering us from trials. You see that? The patience factor is there because he's leading you in the trial. We'll see some of that in just a minute. Because he's leaving you in the trial. You don't need patience when you're not in a trial. Right? We don't need patience. It's like, you don't even think of patience. I need to be more patient. For what? God's blessing you. Everything's going good. <laughs> you know what I mean? <clears throat> it's in the trial that you need the patience. And he leaves you in that trial until there are certain experiences that you come to. Um. There are things that you experience that you'll learn more from than in any class. And that, in truth, all classes, you don't really learn it until you've gone through some experience where you use it. Okay. Bless you. <clears throat> all right. So experience, hold, let me just stop right there because i got a lot more scriptures here to go. The whole idea being that patience is required when you're in the trial. The word patience will always signal to you if God's talking about patience, right now he has no plan of delivering you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know. 
All right, uh, let's see. Let's go to, um, you know, let's go to 1 Peter 4. First Peter chapter four and verses twelve through fourteen. First Peter four twelve. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to test you. All right. First thing to note is he calls you beloved. He doesn't say. You are a bad person, and that's why this is about to come on you. That you are beloved. The other one said, brethren, count it all joy. You're in the family. <laughs> brethren, count it all joy. Whatever you're going through, uh, you're in the family. I can tell. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> Jesus didn't run from the cross. And, and he didn't say, he didn't resign himself to the cross. Jesus is Christ crucified. And here's what I mean by that. Here's what I mean by that. The cross didn't make Jesus who he was. He made the cross something. He's the one that was born crucified. He's the one that already came to um, be the express image of, of the invisible God, which is this kind of spirit, this selfless to that degree, to that degree, even the death of the cross. <clears throat> um, and we have to say that to con try to comprehend that. It. It's beyond that degree. It is, you know, beyond. But we have to look at the cross and go, well, that's, that's a bad one. So he's really self-giving. <clears throat> uh, let's see. So the second thing to notice is, beloved, think it not strange concerning the, the fiery trial. And how many of us have read that and read it bunches of times? And then one day, just unexpectedly, some big trial hits us. And we go, what is this? Why? Why is this happening? What? Why? Who? When? And we got all these questions and all these freak outs. And we don't know what's going on. I mean, see, we have the scripture and we should just read that and go, okay, I'm going to believe that. But really what most Christians today want is no scriptures I just want, when that trial comes, for the Holy Spirit to go, and we go, what is this? What are, what? And the Holy Spirit goes, beloved, think it not strange. And we go, oh, okay. You know, the word of God's not good enough. We have to have divine intervention. I told somebody the other day, they were talking about divine intervention. I said, you know, Divine inter intervention is the cross. When God brings the cross into our life, that's the divine intervention. It circumvents the flow of the flesh. Amen. That's divine. <laughs> that's divine glory. <laughs> you know, you'll never enjoy that. <laughs> you'll never enjoy that until you get so sick of your flesh that that looks good to you. <laughs> You'll just go, oh, thank God, divinely intervene in my life with the cross. <clears throat> Hallelujah. All right. Think it not strange concerning the fi fiery trial, which is to test you. Okay, so <clears throat> as though some strange thing happened to you. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that sometimes things come our way and they come from God. And he's just testing you. There's another place we'll see that also. But he's just testing your faith. 
And when we say testing your faith, I don't know if I want to try to explain that right this moment, but I'm telling you that it's not what most people think. Um, he's testing your faith in things that cannot be shook. Everything that can be shook will be shook. Did you know that? All right. So that should make you feel comfortable. <laughs> Everything that can be shook will be shook. Yeah. Think it not strange that your life just crumbled. <laughs> and why did it just crumble? Because you crumbled, you know, to, to test your faith. Okay, let's, let's move on. To test you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice! All right, anybody seen a theme running through all these scriptures that we're looking at? A theme that is contrary to our minds and in many cases to our will? Well, I would say they're contrary to our mind, our will, and our emotions because we're wanting to freak out. We're going, oh, whoa, oh, oh, you know, he's, and the Lord's saying, rejoice, you know. Well, <clears throat> You're not going to rejoice unless you ask wisdom of God. You're not. You're not. There's no way. You can't, okay? Um, uh, that it's a little bit like asking a kid to go do a, you know, it's like if Naphtali was, you know, like eight, six years old, and, and I said, Naphtali, go out there and uh, rebuild the engine on my car, would you? You know, I remember saying stuff like that to her, and she... Daddy, I don't know how. <laughs> you know? Daddy, I don't know how. One time we were at a, neighbor, a uh, brother and sister's house, and she was real little. Very, she, she could speak full, fully, but she was this little bitty thing, so people were always shocked that she could even speak, you know? And so we're going out the door. We had fellowship and stuff. We're getting at the door, and the neighbor says, Oh, wait a minute, you know? And Lisa wasn't born yet. He went and got an orange and gave it to her <coughs> and said, uh, here you go. She stood there with it, just kind of looking at it. And I said, what do you say? And she looked at the orange, looked at the person, looked at the orange, said, peel it. <laughs> but rejoice all right, it's not enough to rejoice, but to rejoice in as much as we become partakers. We are partakers of the sufferings of Christ. All right, that's part of this study right here. We divide in this book, we divide things up. Uh, see if I can, well, I've, I've got a lot of other chapters too. Um, but we talk about the difference between chastisement and the sufferings of Christ, which the scriptures talk about both, amen? The testing of God, which we just read something about that. The tempting of Satan. Do you know the difference? <clears throat> uh, and then I have a section just called Common Afflictions and... Um, a labor pains, bringing forth Christ. Labor pains. And then uh, maybe, I don't know if that's the last, yeah. And the last one is the revelation of Christ. All that it takes to get us to a place where the veil can be rent and we can see Jesus. And that's, Ultimately, folks, that's the goal. That will be the end goal. And really and truly, all of those things will come into play when, to get that in. All of them. God will use, here we go, all things to work together to that end, including chastisement, including temptation of the devil, including God testing us, and including the sufferings of Christ. <coughs> all right. 
Getting close here. Um, Partakers of the sufferings of Christ, that when his glory shall be revealed. Okay, now, here's what we think. <clears throat> I'm going to partake of the sufferings of Christ, and I'm going to fellowship him in it until his glory be revealed. And then, but guess what? The glory is the cross. Jesus said, now, and this is uh, John 12, 23. Now is the Son of Man, he's about to talk about dying on the cross. Now is the Son of Man glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the seed fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. All right. How do you change the minds of, of Christians on all of these fronts of, of rejoicing, of, of, of not looking for glory in uh, the resurrection, as it were, but in the death, um, where we see the glory of his nature. We see the lamb in glory. How do you change 2,000 years of, I'll be kind, wrong leanings, leaning in directions that take us away from the reality of his heart and of what he's trying to say in his word and of, of what he's looking for and testing us for to, to obtain something out of us that is more precious than gold to him. Mm, mm. So, he, so he never gets that. He never gets that because we, we would never allow ourselves to be put in that situation because everything's the devil. You know, it's not. I'm just, I'm just talking like that. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't get a bunch of amens <laughs> because everything's the devil. Amen. I quit. <laughs> that, when it, that, is, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. All right, just consider for a moment the disciples. Three and a half years with Jesus, walking with Jesus. How's that sound? Of course, that's the same guy we're talking about, Jesus. That's the same guy who said, I've got to go away and send my comforter. I've got to send the Holy Spirit, you know, and he'll teach you about me. You'll get it better from him. Um, because Jesus isn't going to declare himself. That's the way the Godhead is. So they're with Jesus, and they're excited, and God's doing stuff, and God is with us, and man, oh man, this is great, and all of a sudden, you know, and, and here's, your, here's your good Friday message. which is this Friday. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, you know, Jesus says, okay, look, we're, and he's continually talking to them about it. We've got to go up to Jerusalem, and when I get there, they're going to crucify the Son of Man. They're going to me, uh, shamefully treat me, and da 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 And for every time he would say that, he would have to say that after some miracle he did, and they all would go, this is it. This is, the, he's fixing to be king. And this is going to, he's going to be the one. <clears throat> and Jesus would try to explain to them, and they never got it. And many times it said, and they understood not these things until after the resurrection. All right. So finally he gets to Jerusalem, and he starts coming into Jerusalem, and they got palm branches and they're waving them all at each side and, you know blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord Jesus is not coming in the name of the Lord Jesus is the Lord okay. I'm glad you're here in his name you know <clears throat> um, and waving these branches and I'm just picturing Jesus because remember his mindset was I'm here for the cross 
I mean, just think what his mind must have been view, you know, what he's thinking and what he's seeing people doing before him. I mean, really, I mean, come on, think that through. I mean, make it more than just a little story. Find Jesus in it and find the heart of the Lord. And, and he's going, this is not what I'm here for. This is not it. You've all missed it. You're all waving palm branches, and you're all supposed to be branches instead of waving branches, you know. Oh, this glorifies you. No, if you would live like a branch, that would glorify me. And this is the Father glorified that you bring forth much fruit. That You know where that scripture's at, John 15, where he's talking about us being branches and abiding in him because we bring forth his fruit. All right, so, I mean, don't you think some of these thoughts surely went through his mind when he's going, this, is, this leads nowhere. If I accepted this, there would be no salvation. You would all still be in your sins and expecting me to rule over you and do something with you. And he's thinking, oh, I'm going to do something with you, all right. I'm heading to the cross to take you with me. So that you and your, you know, you know, we go, we say, yes, Jesus took us to the cross so that we in our sinful ways, no, in our palm branch waving ways. <laughs> right? You know? He's, I mean, if you could think of the agony that he's going through looking at that and just going, and they're going, oh, this is it. And, you know, look. You know, I can see the disciples, you know, running along beside him, you know, the donkey. Look at this, man. Look, it's happening. It's really happening. Glory. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> just wait till tonight. But he, he surely must have had to keep his focus on the Father and on the plan and on what he came for. And I remember about 10 years ago, I guess it was a little longer than that, it was about 15, 20 years ago, and somebody came to me and they, they were saying something about, hey, um, I heard that they might be um, coming to Denton and wanting to talk to some churches because they want to put some people on their television show. And, you know, I mean, I think they might come to New Creation because, you know, we've got a, a, a women's shelter and a men's shelter and a, a giveaway food and we, we've got a Bible school and... Um, you know, we've got all these buildings and we're right here on the corner of UNT and, um, sorry, NTSU. That's what it was called back then, North Texas State University. <coughs> and they said, w what would you do if they invited you on the show to talk to you? And I remember just thinking, that just would not end well. It just would not end well. Because, first of all, I'm not here to glory in me or what we've done because we've done nothing. Um, hopefully, we be if we believe Jesus really did this, you know what I mean? Not this. I know we did this, but that back then. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but to point to the... But to point to Jesus and to point to the cross continually would bother them, you know. And I didn't want to bother them, you know. I don't. I'm. I'm not into bothering people. And somebody said, "Well, they need to be rebuked." I'm not a prophet, you know. I just. I just love Jesus. I mean, I can barely say I'm a pastor. You know, I just love Jesus. I just want Jesus. I can't, it's like, well, go ahead and rebuke them and maybe lead them in. 
I feel just called to his feet, you know. I, I feel more like Martha than I do Joshua, <laughs> you know. I just want to, you know, I remember one time thinking, you know, if somebody said, well, what if you could become this great minister? And I said, I'm already at the highest place I could ever be, at the feet of Jesus. It's the highest place I want to attain to, if you will. Now, that means we're in him and all that, but it is the reality that, all glory and honor. You, you know, John said, John the Baptist said, I'm not even worthy to unlatch his shoelaces. I just, I'll just hang down here at the lowest point. But as long as it's Jesus, I'll just be as happy as I can be. You know, the, the Spirit of God didn't come to declare himself. He came to declare Jesus. And if we really let the Spirit of God move the way he wants to, oh, he'll move those other ways because he won't fight against it. He's, he's a dove. But if we let him move the way he wants to, it's going to be like what John the Baptist said when Jesus shows up. He's talking about he's coming, and when he comes, the crooked will be made straight, and the high will be brought down, and the low will be brought up, and everything. And I always see this road, and I see God, you know, this road's this crooked road and everything, and I see God reach down two long hands and just go, you know, there it is, you know. And just and the, everything that's all high, and hey, we're, we're something, and whoa, brought down everything that's just low. He, he does exalt that which is low. Now let's hope it doesn't go, yeah, now yeah, I'm something. Because, you, because lowliness is not the key. Seeing Christ for who he is is the key, and that will bring you down, but it will also bring your heart up to him. And we need to stop. We do. So I hope you don't forget this. <laughs>